had also left an indelible impression on many educational, cultural, and social institutions, not only in Maharashtra, but in the entire country. Many of you may be aware that he was the Chief Secretary of Maharashtra and the city's municipal commissioner as well. In 2001, when he became the president of the Asiatic Society, the society was facing many problems, among which that serious problem was the financial crunch as always. The staff also was dissatisfied and the bicentenary of the society was just two years away. Within a week of his taking over as the president of uh, this society, he brought everything under control and created really a strong team of like-minded people who worked along with him for the well-being of the society. He had a great knack of dealing with the staff and settled many issues with a lot of sensitivity. He was also a very disciplined man with great integrity and all held him in high esteem. He worked for so many other institutes also, like he headed the museum board, Bombay Natural History Society, Agni, Praja, and so many more. His mantra for every institution was good governance. It was his firm belief that good governance alone would lead to the growth and development of any institution, and this is precisely he, was, he provided to all the institutions under his leadership. He has left a rich legacy of good governance behind him. In order to remind us of the importance of governance, he has made a magnificent donation of rupees 10 lakhs to our society so that we could hold an annual lecture, seminar, or workshop on this subject. Now for today's lecture, this is the eighth lecture, we have invited Paranjay Guhata Kurta, who is an independent journalist, author, publisher, educator, documentary filmmaker, and consultant. His work experience spanning over four decades cuts across different media, that is print, radio, television, and documentary cinema. He is a writer, speaker, anchor, interviewer, teacher. So many roles at a time he is handling very efficiently. He served as editor of the Economic and Political Weekly between April 16 to July 17. He has authored, co-authored books on correlation politics in India, media ethics, and crony capitalism, and published over 25 books in association with authors up front. As you are aware, today he will be speaking on good governance of natural resources in contemporary India. Now, today, chairperson, I don't think uh, it is necessary to introduce again, because recently we have met him as a chief speaker when Dr. David's book was released. But just for two minutes, I would say that as you know, he is a journalist for over four decades with renowned newspaper groups like Times of India, Indian Express, etc. Awards and honors were bestowed upon him as Padma Shri in a year 2001, then Rajiv Gandhi Award for Excellence in Media, Giants International Award for International Coverage, then Doordarshan Award Ratna Darpan for Journalistic Excellence, Maharashtra Bhushan in Journalism by Government of Maharashtra, and Lifetime Achievement in Journalism by Maharashtra Foundation USA. He had al already attended some international assignments also, but I feel more, I had heard from the staff he was working with that how open-minded, how liberal, and how friendly he worked with them, not as a boss, but as a real friend. And that, I think, is a very important thing for all of us. So I welcome both of you, and I request our president Welcome with a small memento. This is a bag with books, not a 
So welcome again all of you. Let us hear now Paranjay Guha Thakur, sir. Thank you, Dr. Meena Vaishampayan, for that very generous and fulsome introduction that you've given me. It is indeed my honor and my privilege to be here with you this evening. Bhalchandra Gopal Deshmukhji, who passed away in 2011, was not just, as was pointed out earlier, the Chief Secretary of Maharashtra and the Municipal Commissioner of the city. He had a very unusual aspect to him. He was the principal, he was appointed by the late Rajiv Gandhi as principal secretary. But he went on to remain as principal secretary after Rajiv Gandhi was voted out of power in December 1989. And he remained the principal secretary of the prime minister under Vishwanath Pratap Singh and then Chandrasekhar. So that uh, I think is uh, just gives you one's inkling of his qualities as a bureaucrat. Uh, before I commence speaking, and I will be speaking with you, speaking to you, no, with you, for about an hour or so, I just want to briefly recall my association with the Asiatic Society. This is the first time I'm walking into this museum. My first association with the Asiatic Society was in Kolkata, where I was born. It's, it was set up a few years older, and it was under unusual circumstances. I was a reporter with the newspaper called The Telegraph, and a, a, a lady there, who became a friend of mine, leaked, quote unquote, information to me and said how there had been a lot of resistance from within the committee that ran the Asiatic Society in Kolkata to change the prices of the volumes that were available for sale. I mean, they were those days still designated in annas when there were no annas to be given out. And he said, don't believe me, you come and buy it. And I picked up a book which to me would have been an antique book for some ridiculous amount of money like five rupees or something like that or even less. And then I wrote an article saying, look, this is what happened to me. And uh, soon thereafter the committee met and they decided that it's about time that they realized that the books they were quote unquote selling to the public at large were really antiques and, and very valuable books and they should reprice it. It's, I'm so happy today that I have so many friends here to listen to me. And I hope I will not uh, bore you. I, therefore, I realize I'm, every, every single word I'm saying is going to be recorded. So if I say something uh, which is even a little all right, or I say something which I cannot own up to, in public, then I'm in trouble. Because not only is it being recorded, uh, I was told that it, they could put it up on YouTube, you know. So I have to be very, very careful about what I say. But nevertheless, I will try and not pull my punches and mince my words. And there is a 10,000 page note, a paper, which I will tweak and rework and send soon to the Asiatic Society, and that will be distributed, and therefore anything and everything I say is going to be on the record. If you want any statement off the record, feel free to ask me after the program is over. So let me start by just outlining the broad theme of what I'm going to say. I mean, in India, there's been a considerable amount of controversy over the manner in which natural resources have been allocated and priced. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on five, five topics, simply because I have done some work on the subject over the last decade and a half. So I'm going to talk about 
telecommunications spectrum, which is actually thin air, but it's a natural resource. It's a resource that belongs to everybody. And unlike the other resources which, about which I'm going to talk about, that's coal, iron ore, natural gas, and land, spectrum is a renewable resource. After all, it's thin air. Nevertheless, it's valuable because it's finite. It's finite for a variety of reasons and therefore scarce. And I'm going to start by talking about the well-known second generation telecommunication spectrum scam, also known as the 2G scam. And as you know, in the run-up to the 2014 elections, it was very much in the news. And uh, the present ruling party at that time had made a big issue out of 2G, CWG, Commonwealth Games, and of course, Jijaji, as you know. Uh, but we'll talk about that a little later. But the point is, these resources belong to the people of this country. They, they don't belong to any one of us, and, and they don't uh, even actually belong to the government. Because in the very famous Cricket Association of Bengal case, the Supreme Court ruled that the airwaves belong to the people. And the government, when it fails to act as an impartial, transparent custodian or guardian of resources that belong to the people, then each and every one of us as citizens of this country have every right not only to be offended, we can protest. And, and there were good reasons why there, were, there have been and continue to be protests about the way in which spectrum, coal, iron ore, gas and land have been allocated, have been priced and continue to be priced. Now, what I'm going to focus on is how, oh, the second point is that these resources not only belong to every citizen, it belongs to future generations as well. So these resources not only belong to each and every one of us as citizens of this country, but it belongs to our children and their children. So this whole issue of intergenerational equity and allocation and pricing also becomes significant. Even as I'm talking, there's a draft national mineral policy that has been put out by the government of India, and uh, a large number of people are commenting on it, and all of you should feel free, because I think there's still some time uh, for people to comment on this policy, and you can talk about the anomalies and talk about all the, the problems. And I, I personally know a, a group in Goa who feel very, very perturbed about the manner in which iron ore mining has taken place in that state and actually devastated the, the environment of that area, and they believe it's very important. Uh, so all of you as citizens should go to the government of India, the Ministry of Mines, and, and see this policy, and comment on the policy, and make your suggestions on the policy. <coughs> I believe, and I argue, that the problem essentially is that successive governments and I'm going to largely talk about the previous United Progressive Alliance gov government as well as the present government, the Bharatiya Janata Party-led National Democratic Alliance government. They are reasons to believe that the way in which nat natural uh, resources have been governed, allocated, prices, priced, has, is less than optimal, has been less than good. And one of the reasons is what we call the nexus between business and politics. Big business, big politics. And this nexus, I believe, and I'm not, I think, unique, I think many of us believe, that this is arguably one of the most important sources of corruption, big ticket corruption. And this has also got a lot to do with the way our politicians, our political parties, our uh, elections, election campaigns are funded, financed, and, and so what happens is that a lot of the profits that have been obtained by exploiting natural resources have been appropriated by a rent-seeking elite. And I argue that, and I'm again not unique in arguing, this has resulted in a phenomenon which we call the resource curse. 
when natural resources that belong to the people of this country become an instrument for their exploitation instead of benefiting them. Mother Nature's blessings, instead of being benefiting large numbers of people, become a curse. And you see this across the world and also in India. I mean, the infamous dictator of Liberia, Charles Taylor, had famously given a diamond the size of a golf ball to Naomi Campbell. And maybe some of you are aware of the blood diamonds that exist. I mean, I mean, minerals, access to minerals have been the source of such conflict, devastation, rape, human lives lost, children, innocent children, orphaned. What we find is a phenomenon which is there across the world. And it's particularly evident in large parts of the global south. At different points of time, it's existed in other parts of the world as well, including what we say the developed north. Again, I'm, I'm kind of oversimplifying. They've been given different names. Sometimes one version of it is called the Dutch disease. The Dutch suddenly found that there's so much gas and, you know, they didn't know how to do it, uh, how to deal with that. Uh, this is the North Sea gas. But I'm, I'm digressing a little bit to point out that the business of politics and the politics of business have acquired dimensions in the recent past that have completely distorted the working of India's political economy. So I'm going to speak extempore. I might refer to my notes. And uh, if you want to ask me specific questions, I'll be more than happy to answer these questions for you. Now, I want to start with something that's topical. And I'm speaking extempore. But I have all the facts, and I can provide all the facts. As for my opinions, well, you don't have to agree with my opinions. But uh, I hope you will not have occasion to challenge my facts. It's being recorded for posterity. Fine. So I have to be very careful. The so-called 2G scam became, was described as, the biggest scandal in independent India. Then people said, no, it's actually not just the biggest scandal of independent India. It's the biggest scandal in the world. Because a figure of what is called a notional loss or a presumptive loss, phrases that were used by the former controller and auditor general, Mr. Vinod Rai, these were, after all, his argument was this was money that could have come to the government, but did not. It could have come to the exchequer, it could have, but did not. Now, it's interesting that I'm talking to you today when, after the former Union Telecommunications Minister, Mr. Andimutu Raja, belonging to the DMK, the Dravida Munnetra Karagam, spent 15 months behind bars, Ms. Kanimui, the daughter of the former Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu and the leader of the DMK, Mr. Karun Karunanithi, spent almost six months in jail. Today, Mr. Raja is not just protesting his innocence. He's brought out a book. Why? Because on the 21st of December, a special court of the CBI, the Central Bureau of Investigation, headed by Judge O.P. Sani, he examined the various charges of criminality and he acquitted all the 17 individuals who were accused. Now, I'm here going to present to you a critique of this judgment. The 2G scam is well known, but I want to try and tell you why, in my opinion, with all respects to the Honorable Judge, that judgment is deeply flawed. Now, it's a judgment, uh, there's more than one judgment, but the main judgment runs into over 1,500 pages. The Central Bureau of Investigation put out a series of charge sheets which run into more, with, with its annexures, run into more than 80,000 pages. So you can imagine the huge volume of information. And, and, and it took him more than six and a half years to come up with this, uh, with, with his judgment, which, which was on the 21st of December. And uh, it, 
gave everybody, all the 17 individuals who were accused, a clean chit, and that not only included Mr. Raja and Mr. Kanimoi, it included a whole lot of people. There were representatives of the Anil Dhirubhai Ambani group, there was a former telecom secretary, uh, there was uh, the, the well-known builders, Mr. Shahid Usman Balwa, there were other entrepreneurs, Sanjay Chandra, there were three employees of the ADAG, I just mentioned them, Gautam Doshi, Surendra Pipara, uh, Hari Nair. Reliance Telecom itself was one of the uh, accused persons, uh, corporate entities are also persons in legal jargon. <clears throat> now, why, as a, I mean, first of all, let me first say I am an interested party. Why am I an interested party? I was one of the three petitioners in not the judgment or the petitions that were moved before Judge Saini's court, but in an earlier judgment which went up to the Supreme Court where 122 licenses were cancelled in February. 2012. I was one of the petitioners. So I'm, I'm, I'm an interested party and I want to make that known to all of you right up front. <clears throat> now, Mr. Raja has described the then Controller and Auditor General of India as a contract killer. Uh, uh, he's also supposed to be a part of a political conspiracy against the Manmohan Singh government. Okay, Here am I arguing why this judgment is deeply flawed. Which is not the same thing as saying that the CBI and the prosecution could not or should not have done much better than they did in proving criminal intent by providing what the judge describes as legally admissible evidence. And here I'll discuss some of my Dear lawyer friends are here also, they know much more than I about the Indian Evidence Act. But my contention is that Judge Saini read the statute, the Indian Evidence Act and the Criminal Procedure Code in a very, very narrow and in my opinion legalistic manner. Now, I do believe that he should perhaps have taken a more sort of a holistic view and looked at policies, procedures, and also the allegations of criminality. So, so let me go step by step. Policies. Now, it was a policy which was called first served, first come, first served. Okay. So the first question that I asked, that under certain circumstances, you can have such a policy. But if you look at the way it all happened, there was something terribly wrong. There were people suited, booted, rushing to Sanchar Bhavan to be the first to present a bunch of papers, including bank guarantees running into huge amounts of money, over a thousand crores, and they were given a 45-minute window to do it. So yes, they knew about it. So when Judge Saini was asked, how did they know about it? He says, everything from Sanchar Bhavan leaks. That was the justification. Now, when you are allocating a scarce national resource, a natural resource that belongs to the people, should you allocate? Um, the question I'm asking is, should these be allocated in the manner in which cinema tickets are sold? Cinema ticket is first come, first served. Now, okay, you've stood in queue, uh, you really want to be the first day, first show person. You're a great fan of Shah Rukh Khan and Piggy Chop, so you've been standing in queue patiently. And, and just when you think the box office, the proverbial box office is there in front of you, suddenly somebody from behind you pulls you out. And he said, no, 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 no. You can't be there. This guy behind you is going to get the ticket first. Am I exaggerating? No. What happened is on the 10th of January, policy of allocation was changed retrospectively. It was in 2010. And am I? Hold on, hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the year. It's, it's all in the public domain. The CAG report came later. Am I, have I got that right? One second. 
August 1996. No, 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 no. Sorry, 2008. I stand corrected. My, my uh, 10th of January 2008, the window was 2.45 p.m. Sanchar Bhavan. The letters of intent were given. So even if by a fraction of a second you were wrong, you wouldn't get it. Now, the earlier cutoff date was in the previous year, that is 2007. The cutoff date was supposed to be the 30th of September. Suddenly, on the 10th of January, you changed the date and said, no, it's actually 10 days earlier. There was a reason given that we had received too many applications. It was not possible to give everybody. So you suddenly, arbitrarily use a cutoff date. Right through, Mr. Raja said, this is a decision of my, my bureaucrats. All along, he said, this is a cabinet system of government. Why are you going after me? If I am responsible, then so is Mr. Chidambaram and so is Dr. Manmohan Singh. That was his justification, and he continues to use that logic. So, there were two press releases issued, and, and uh, so, so the point I'm trying to make is that not only should the first come, first serve system not have been used, the way in which these procedures were changed, in my opinion, arbitrarily, smacked off corruption and nep nepotism. And it's all been documented. A whole lot of information, there's already a book published on the subject. Maybe another book needs to be written. But the whole issue about foreign, foreign uh, joint venture, uh, the no cap on the number of entrants, I could go on and on uh, with uh, the technical details, uh, but you'll get them all in my paper. Every single technical detail is given. The CAG used strong language, called it the way these companies gave in their application, he called them false, called them fictitious, called them without any basis. I didn't, the CAG did. So, Mr. Raja now is a free person, of course, he has the right to free information. I want to just mention, highlight one more example before I move on to the other point. One of these companies which allegedly got the license without deserving it was a company called Swan Telecom which was allegedly a front company of the Anil Dhirubhai Ambani group. Now, Swan Telecom, according to one view, was a front company and was not eligible to invest in it because it was uh, Reliance Communications already had an interest, so it could at best hold 10% of the equity capital. Now, those of you who are aware of the technical details about the kinds of shares, equity shares, preference shares, the way it worked was interesting. Reliance, uh, Rcom, Reliance Communication, invested 1,003 crores in Swan, but 992 crore came in the form of preference shares, ostensibly to ensure that Rcom did not hold more than 10% of the equity shares of Swan Telecom. Now, this is the way the corporate sector works. Now, for instance, if you want to define control as 50%, uh, over 50%, how does it work? You have corporate entity, say, A. Corporate entity A is held by corporate entity B, 50%. Corporate entity B is held by corporate entity C, also holds 50%. Corporate entity C is held by com company A, also 50%. So no one company is holding 51%. They're associated, but they're not controlling. The interest is not a controlling interest. These are legal terms, but this is the way it's used. In fact, they, uh, uh, if you go through uh, the judgment, you'll come across a veritable menagerie of animals and birds. So swan, with swan associated were pelican, and there was cheetah, and there was tiger, and, and, and uh, interesting animals, uh, well, okay. When Sri Anil Ambani appeared before judge, the judge, he says, actually I signed so many annual reports and I signed so many balance sheets. I don't remember the names of all these companies. He actually said that. His wife, uh, Tina Ji, invited the judge to visit the hospital that they are running in Mumbai where a lot of good work is being done. But the point is, it's recorded that 
uh, Anil Ambani ji did not remember the names of all the companies whose official records bore his signature. He said, this is, this, of course, this is my signature, but I signed so many papers and I signed the balance sheets and annual accounts of so many people that I do not remember all the names. Now, the last point that I want to make, uh, uh, two more points in the, in the 2G case before I move on, is when you look at the criminality part of it. There is a, there is a company, a television channel called Kaliner Television Channel. Now, this television channel is affiliated to the DMK. I mean, it's not exactly an official secret. I mean, everybody knows that it puts out certain kinds of programs. It has a certain political affiliation. Now, Kalina Television Channel was given a quote-unquote a loan of 2014 crore, which was, of course, repaid very promptly by a company called Kusegao Fruits and Vegetables. Kusegao was controlled by the brother of one of the accused persons, Shahid Usman Balwa. And Karimui denied knowledge of the loan. So did Mr. Raja. He says, I don't know about this company. It didn't matter that he was a member of parliament belonging to the same party. That Karimui's father also heads that party that Kanimoi's stepmother is a major shareholder in that company. So, they denied. They said this came also much later, after the letters of intent came, but then after the letters of intent were converted into licenses, etc., etc., etc. So the short point is, there was, according to Mr. Raja, Ms. Kanimoi, which Justice Judge Saini believed, there was no quid pro quo, right? So the license, the grant of the license had allegedly nothing to do with the fact that a loan was given to a company. The judge was very, very critical of the prosecution, not only for not being diligent. They said when the, the whole hearing started, they were very, very, very uh, diligent and then they seem to be losing interest. This is what the judge has remarked. It's part of the judgment. It's interesting that the same judge was himself seen to be a very, very tough judge. And I'm not even passing any judgment about his personal integrity. And he, he may have rose risen to that position from after being a constable, but that's just facts I'm stating to you. He not only summoned some of the richest men in India, including Mr. Sunil Bharti Mittal and various others, to appear in that court, Patiala House Court in Delhi, at one stage when Kanimoi's lawyers argued that why are you putting this, this woman behind bars? She spent almost six months behind bars. He says, no, so what? She's a, so what if she's a member of parliament? So what if she's associated with this political party? She's a citizen, like the law is above no man, etc., etc., etc. The law is above no man or woman for that matter. So, the last point that I want to make is an issue that Dr. Manmohan Singh himself has mentioned. And this came in the context of the Radia conversations and the fact that the, the way in which these licenses were given and the way in which Mr. Raja was reappointed in the second UPA government uh, was because of what has been described as the compulsions of coalition politics. Hindi mein Gatbandhan Rajniti ke majpuriya. Alright. I want to state certain facts and raise a question to you. While the second UPA government was in power in Delhi, uh, starting May 2009, it was a minority government, it was a coalition government, it depended on the support of 14 members of parliament belonging to the DMK. Second fact, the Tamil Nadu government in Chennai, led by Mr. Karunanidhi, depended, depended on the support of 35 members of the Legislative Assembly, 
for a majority in the Vidhan Sabha between May 2006 and May 2011. The question, who needed whom more? Mr. Karunanidhi needed Dr. Manmohan Singh more or vice versa? I leave this as a question. Topic number two, Colgate. I assure you it has got nothing to do with your sensitive teeth. It's about the alleged misallocation of coal blocks, coal bearing blocks. And it's, the coal is the biggest, I mean it is a, a major mineral and it's not just a major mineral, it's a mineral that's very, very important to the working of this country, this, this, uh, the, the economy. Because roughly half, you know, it, that proportion is coming down, but at the time the so-called coal gate scandal broke out, uh, more than half of the total electricity which was consumed and used in this country was based on coal. Therefore, coal is very important to the country and its economy. Uh, there's a long history behind coal mining, but the point is even today, roughly 80% of the total coal is produced by public sector companies, Coal India Limited and its various subsidiaries. Now, once again, just as Mr. Vinod Rai was accused of playing, what would you say? Hitman, oh, no, not Hitman, what did he say? I'm, I'm, what did Mr. Raja say? I'm, contract killer, oh I'm so sorry, I, I stand corrected. Contract killer whose job was to, you know, sort of uh, uh, lead a, a sort of part of a political conspiracy to destabilize the Manmohan Singh government. And uh, of course he got a nice job after that in the present government. He headed a bank's appointments bureau but he, I, I understand, and my friend Hemendra Hazari here would testify that maybe he's not so happy in his new job, uh, but for different reasons altogether. But the short point is the same story. You are allocating a scarce natural resource in an opaque and a discretionary manner, which, according to the Supreme Court of India, also violated the law. So, 214 coal blocks which were allocated to private companies from 1993 till 2013 were declared illegal by the Supreme Court in August 2014. Once again, the amount was humongous, 1,86,000 crore. Okay, that's like 186 followed by 10 zeros, yeah. I mean, the Times of India and the Indian Express had all the zeros put up there. It was a sensational headline. After all, uh, these are even bigger than the 2G scam. Now, I argue that the way it was allocated was really smacked off what I would describe as crony capitalism. And since I'm being recorded, let me name the names. Among the important individuals who were identified and connected with the promoters and directors of the private companies that had obtained rights to mine coal, such persons included many affiliated to the Congress party, including the Nagpur member of parliament uh, and the newspaper baron, Sri Vijay Dartha, his brother, the then Maharashtra education minister, Sri Rajendra Dartha, the former MP uh, from Kurukshetra, Mr. Naveen Jindal, his brother-in-law, as well as former Union Minister Subodh Khan Sahai, one-time Union Minister for Food Processing, uh, besides former three former Ministers of State for Coal, Sri Prakash Jaiswal, Santosh Bagrodia, Dasari Narayan Rao, he's no more with us. Uh, and there was, of course, uh, uh, a DMK politician, Jagat Rakshakan, who uh, was a former Minister of State for Information and Broadcasting. They were all accused of there were various allegations, and even at that time, to be fair, two other members of parliament, their names came up. I'm not saying anything, any criminality was proved. Their names came up in the context of this camp, and that was uh, 
uh, Rajya Sabha Member of Parliament uh, belonging to the Bharatiya Janata Party, Ajay Sancheti, who is supposed to be close to the Union Minister for Road, Transport and Highways, and the former pra Party President, the President of the Bharatiya Janata Party, Sri Nitin Gadkari. So, uh, you see, essentially the scandal took a sudden and a dramatic turn in April 2013. The, the Supreme Court castigated the CBI, described it as a, as, as a caged parrot, Pinjirimi Tota. And top law, the law minister Shri Ashwini Kumar had to put in his papers, the, the CBI director Ranjit Sinha also was described in rather uncharitable terms. The additional solicitor general, Mr. Harin Rawal also had to put in his papers. And uh, questions were raised about the actions of the then Attorney General of India, Gulam Vahanwati. Uh, now, there are two things that are common which I need to flag between Colgate and the 2G scam. And one of that was that in both cases, the then Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, actually put out statements in Parliament justifying his position. It, it really doesn't happen that way. The CAG's reports are examined by a committee of parliament and then the government gives what is called an action taken report. But in both cases, uh, the then Prime Minister, Dr. Singh, actually issued public statements in parliament uh, because for various reasons, uh, certain questions and certain fingers were being pointed at him. Now, if you think Colgate is over, all these blocks have been cancelled. I need to give you some information which I picked up today itself. And it's very authentic, uh, the information, and you are welcome to verify it and check it. This is courtesy a uh, journalist called Noor Muhammad, who's written an article in The Wire. And this concerns the manner in which Shakti, Shakti has been implemented. Shakti is the scheme for harnessing and allocating koila transparently in India, Shakti. Uh, this government is great at acronyms, all credit to them. Essentially, the then energy minister, Mr. Piyush Goel, in, uh, announced this scheme. And he said one of the ways we are going to do it is the old criticism of Colgate was that you know, you have a bunch of bureaucrats and representatives of different governments behind closed doors and you decide A should get it and B should get it and C should get it instead of having a public auction. So Mr. Goel said, no, we will do it in a transparent manner. And then he gave a new angle to the bidding, which is uh, uh, in principle a great idea. He called it reverse bidding. So if you get an allocation of a coal block and, and you get a linkage to uh, providing you coal, then whoever charges the least consumer of electricity should be given that bid. Great. Great idea. Great. Excellent. So in September 2017, <coughs> Coal India allocated power to 10 private power projects. Uh, uh, a total amount in excess of 25, uh, sorry, 27 million tons with an assured supply for 25 years, a quarter of a century. Because these are long gestation periods and they give them a short supply. And indeed, 10 private companies who bid this for this, uh, they promised to reduce their tariff. Some 1 paisa, some 4 paisa, between 1 and 4 paisa per unit per kilowatt hour. Now what has happened is very interesting. According to this article that I've read, and I have very good reason to believe it's very, very authentic, the gain to these 10 private producers could be as much as 50,000 crore. Why? If you assume, assume the calculations which are transparently made that you reduce the electricity charge in proportion to the relatively cheap and the assured supply of coal that you're getting, then it should actually come down by 50 paisa per unit. But the amount was between 1 and 4 paisa. And uh, no prizes for guessing. The gentleman who heads the corporate conglomerate which got over a third of this coal. Uh, his name is Mr. Gautam Adani. 
He happens to be the head of the Adani group. And uh, he also happens to be not just the biggest producer of uh, electricity in the private sector, he's also the big, one of the biggest transmitters of electricity in the private sector, not just coal-based energy, also solar energy. He also happens to be the biggest importer of coal to India, and he also happens to be the, one of the, the biggest mining operator for coal. This is Mr. Gautam Adani, who is, of course, one of the richest men in India. Uh, he's from Gujarat. Fact, madam. I make no, no allegation of any kind. I'm merely making statements. Uh, all right? So, uh, time will tell what happens. All, all I can say, I myself have done some research. There is a wing of the uh, Ministry of Finance called the Directorate of Revenue Intelligence. And they've issued various notices to various companies, including companies in the Adani Group, including companies in the Dhirubhai, uh, Rila, uh, Anil Dhirubhai Ambani Group where he said that they have allegedly over-invoiced coal imported from Indonesia. The investigation is still on. One of my esteemed associates helped me in researching this article. Uh, and uh, this was not an article this was, I faced any legal issues with. But this is an article which is again in the public domain. You can have a look at it. But if you uh, look at it, the, the story is the way in which coal was allegedly over-invoiced. There are 50 companies, including public sector companies, mind you. It's not just Adani, Reliance, no, no. It includes the National Thermal Power Corporation, it includes state electricity boards of various, uh, various uh, uh, states. So all of them allegedly fiddle around with the invoicing. Then there are various show cause notices about invoicing of equipment. And, and, and also, there are allegations that they got undue benefits from the regulatory authorities. Now, if you put them all together, it would probably be about another 50,000 crore. That calculation has been made, so you add 50,000, add 50,000, one followed by five zeros. No. Yes, five zeros. Okay. I would like to believe our Honourable Honor Prime Minister, who before he was elected as Prime Minister of the world's largest democracy, said, na khaunga, na khani dunga. So let's hope uh, these investigations proceed, hopefully not at the pace the 2G investigation went, which took three and a half years, but let's see what happens. I uh, quickly move to a topic on which I've written about. A book of mine has been published. Uh, it's called, uh, it's about natural gas. And it's how natural gas was extracted from the Krishna Godavari Basin, which is, uh, as you know, off the coast of Andhra Pradesh in the Bay of Bengal. And uh, this is a, a story actually about, I argue in the book, that the reason why the Ambani siblings didn't get along with each other at a particular point of time. Had very little to do with uh, the fact that uh, it was, not the fact, the perception that Tina and Nita were not the best of friends. I argue that this had a lot to do with the way in which the gas was allotted, the gas was priced. It's, it, it's a long story. I mean, I, I've taken over 500 pages to tell the story. And you're most welcome to read it if you want all the gory details. But there are all kinds of things that have happened. Again, it's a CAG report. There are a lot of published material, public documents. Uh, there is a, a, a follow-up to the story relating to a company called the Gujarat State Petroleum Corporation. And... Uh, the book contains information where, uh, I mean, over 80% of what has been published in that book uh, was in the public domain. I've just collated that information. I've just compiled it. I've just put it together. Uh, certain legal notices were sent on me 
to me, served on me, my co-authors, my publishing associates, Amazon, Flipkart, etc. Four of them, in fact. Uh, I know that uh, no court was moved for reasons best known to the lawyers and those who engaged the lawyers. So there's also another part to the story of the Oil and Natural Gas Corporation, which is now going to be uh, becoming the major shareholder of Hindustan Petroleum Corporation Limited, uh, and allegations of theft between Reliance Industries and ONGC. And uh, that matter is still under arbitration. There have been committee reports, etc. And you can, there's a lot to be said about it, but because of lack of time, I will not dwell on it in great detail. But uh, there is another part to the story. And there's a third part to the story as well. Uh, one of my co-authors, and uh, he's also the, the author of the book, called Grand Illusion. It has nothing to do with a film made by the French director Renoir. Uh, the subtitle is The GSPC Disaster and the Gujarat Model. GSPC, as I told you earlier, is the Gujarat State Petroleum Corporation. Uh, as Chief Minister of Gujarat, uh, Sri Narendra Modi had publicly suggested that the gas that would be uh, obtained by this company would not only make the state of Gujarat energy secure, it might make India energy secure. As you know, we, we import a lot of our energy though we have huge coal reserves, the reserves are of a poor quality, and in recent years we've been importing uh, between 15 and 20 percent of our total consumption of coal. Uh, oil, crude oil, we import 80 percent of our total requirements of crude oil. Uh, so uh, energy security is a big issue like in India, just like food security is a huge issue. But the, the point I was making is that in this particular case, in the case of the Gujarat State Petroleum Corporation, this company, its activities were adversely commented upon by the, the constitutional authority which is responsible for uh, overseeing the finances, public finances. Once again, the CAG comes in, the Controller and Auditor General of India. There have been a series of reports, all of them are in the public domain, and in different parts of the report there have been suggestions made that companies in two groups, once again, my favorite groups, you've heard about them, Ambani and Adani. Uh, their names figure in the report. You can read them for the details, read the book for greater details. Okay, now, this company uh, wasn't able to produce the gas that was believed it would be, that it could produce, but it's nothing new. I mean, this is a highly risky business. This oil and gas exploration business is very, very risky. Uh, those who are industry insiders, they call them the casino business, you know. When you hit the jackpot, you sort of laugh all the way to the bank, but the chances are more people are going to lose money. But anyway, the short point is Gujarat State Petroleum Corporation went deeply into the red, and uh, last year it was its shares, or, or a substantial portion of its shares, was purchased by a company that theoretically is supposed to belong to you and me, the Oil and Natural Gas Corporation, ONGC. Uh, a third book will come out that deals with a large multinational corporations. It's yet, it's under, we're working on it. It's a company called British Petroleum. It's a conglomerate called British Petroleum. Uh, the, I just raise a question and not provide the answer. You know, we journalists are good at asking questions. We don't know the answers, but you're good at asking questions. So I'll stick to that tradition, the bad journalistic tradition. I've been one for 40 years. British Petroleum, BP, the BP group invested 7.2 billion, B, 7.2 billion US dollars to purchase, uh, to buy up 30% stake in a corporate entity which was responsible for extracting gas from the Krishna Godavari Basin. Uh, as is common knowledge, from what was originally supposed to be delivered and what was actually delivered, there is a, a sort of a 90% difference. So if instead of 100, what was actually delivered was about 10. Nevertheless, British Petroleum, very recently, late last year, has told the government 
that it will be investing another nine billion dollars in the country. Good for India. Mera Bharat Mahan. That's a story waiting to be told. I have two short stories to tell you in the 15 minutes I have left. I was, I'm supposed to end my speech at 6.40. And it's like, okay, I have a little less than 15 minutes. This concerns the illegal iron ore mining in Bellari, a district in Karnataka, and Anantapur, which is now located in Telangana, which was earlier part of the undivided uh, state of Andhra Pradesh. I made a film about what I believe is the nexus between not just business and politics, but crime. One of the important persons uh, behind the so-called Bellari iron ore mining scandal was a former Minister for Tourism and Infrastructure Development in Mr. B.S. Yadurappa's government, headed by the BJP. Uh, his name is Gali Janathan Reddy. And his brothers, they were also the son of a police constable. Thanks to a very, very proactive and a very, very amazing uh, Lok Ayukta, uh, his name was Santosh Hegde, uh, he uh, nailed them down and eventually it led to the resignation of uh, Mr. Yadurappa and uh, Sri Gali Janardhan Reddy was put behind bars where he remained for almost three years. But across the border, and of course the borders, the, the dividing lines between the borders were sort of just wiped out. And I have a documentary film, I have a few copies of that. I'm sorry if I'm sort of plugging my own work in such an unabashed manner. Please excuse me for it. Uh, Gauri Lankesh features in it where she talks about how this, the, the, actually the, the borders between the two states were sort of, the pillars were removed, etc., etc., etc. It's a long story, but I'll cut it down. The price of iron ore peaked in the run-up to the Beijing Olympics. And thereafter, what happened was, all this scandal happened. On the other side of the border was the late Y.S. Rajshekar's Reddy's son, Jagan Mohan Reddy, who happens to be the leader of the opposition in the Andhra Pradesh uh, Assembly at present. And his name also came up. He also spent some time behind bars. But Mr. R R uh, Mr. Janardhan Reddy, who I believe was a linchpin of the scam, did claim that he was as pure as 24 karat gold. You would have thought after this, the story would get over. No, actually it didn't happen. The iron ore mining that took place in Bellari and Anantapur not only devastated the environment of that area, destroyed livelihoods, destroyed forests, polluted water, and the land. <laughs> you, uh, find that this was a very, very important uh, constituency, a Lok Sabha constituency. Sonia Gandhi at one point of time had, uh, had, uh, was uh, contested the election. So did our present external affairs minister, Mrs. Sushma Swaraj. Now, uh, sorry, I got that date wrong. Yedu Rappa resigned in July 2011. Janardhan Reddy was arrested by the CBI in September 2011. He spent three years behind bars. A judge who had allegedly tried to bribe, who he had allegedly tried to bribe, was also arrested. Now, after he came out of prison, Gali Janathan Reddy splurged lavishly on his daughter's wedding in Bengaluru in November 2016. This prompted search and seizure raids by the Income Tax Department and those cases are still going on. As you are aware, uh, in 
the world's greatest, world's largest democracy. I didn't say greatest, that was a slip of my tongue. Uh, Mera Bharat Mahan, uh, this great country of ours, uh, Bharat Varsh, India. The long arm of the law can be very, very long. And the wheels of justice, the proverbial wheels of justice, as my lawyer friends here will tell you, not only grind slowly, they can grind excruciatingly slowly. But there are some people for whom it's different. It's a cliche to say that justice delayed and justice denied, that the law favors the rich and the powerful and the wealthy. <coughs> but essentially what you're seeing are different forms of cronyism. And I'll give you two small definitions, and they come from the Cambridge Dictionary. Crony capitalism is defined by the Cambridge, Cambridge Dis Dictionary as an economic system which, which family members and friends of government officials and business leaders are given unfair advantages in the forms of jobs, loans, etc. But the English Oxford Living Dictionaries make the definition of crony capitalism a little simpler. It describes it as an economic system characterized by close, mutually advantageous relationships between business leaders and government officials. So, I conclude or with the last example uh, and a, a little conclusion. The last example pertains to law, uh, the, sorry, land. I, I'm, I'm sort of slipping up some water, sir.